Oh, hey! Fancy meeting you here. My name is Sakata Stardust, and I hope you are all having the loveliest of lovely days wherever you are. This is Yusuke, by the way. Isn't he great? And today, on my beautiful channel that I left abandoned for over a year, we are going to be diving into the wonderful world and mildly, strangely creepy world of lost media. Specifically Japanese lost media because yours truly is weeaboo garbage. Now this is going to include Japanese music, television, uh, anime of course, and video games. There will be 15 on this list, though there is one extra that I don't really consider Japanese media, but it's based on Japanese media, and I thought the story itself was pretty cool, so that's going to be a little bonus at the end. And just to be clear, I will not be looking at dubs um, of any kind of Japanese material like video games or anime in this video. There's a lot of those. Um, if I do a video like this in the future, I will definitely do one on lost dubs. That sounds pretty rad. But for this video, we're just going to be talking about media that's lost that originated in Japan. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey there, editing room Sakura here. Um, in retrospect, looking at that intro and looking at the media that it's segueing into, some of the subject matter is a little, a little disturbing, a little unsettling. Not too bad, I'm not going to show any graphic content, so don't worry about that. But I thought I might as well should warn some viewers since I look pretty damn happy in that intro and that isn't really what I'm segueing into. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's start the video. In the Distance, an unreleased Japanese single from 1986. In the Distance is a lost Japanese single by the late Japanese model and actress Yasuko Endo. The single itself is supposed to include two songs, the first being the titular In the Distance, as well as the B-side track titled Telephone. Endo herself was signed with the record label Canyon, known today as Pony Canyon. The single was never released due to the idol's untimely and surprising death on March 29th of 1986. Yasuko Endo ended her own life, jumping from the roof of her apartment building located in Asakusa, Tokyo. Yasuko Endo was only 17 years old. The single itself was meant to be released in May of 1986, only two months after her death. Due to this, promotions for the single were already in the works. This included reviews of the single printed in multiple magazines at the time. Posters, the cover of the single, and advertisements were likely also underway and in existence out there somewhere, though this is not confirmed. After the shocking death of Yasuko Endo, Pony Canyon claimed to have destroyed all copies they had access to of the single. The studio in charge of recording the single itself, Rivstar Records, unfortunately went out of business in the early 90s due to some pretty shady business practices. But despite that, it is likely that her properties could have been transferred to different ownership after the collapse of the company. The possibility of getting the single released in the future is also possible, as a similar situation occurred following the death of another idol, less than two weeks after Endo's own death. This idol, Yukiko Okada, was incredibly popular and had a successful career with multiple records and singles released up until her own death on April 8th of 1986. Okada ended her own life as well by jumping to her death at only 18 years old. Much like Endo, she also had a single that was set to be released, titled Hana no Image. This single was also cancelled due to her death, as well as the fear of bad press that releasing the singles would likely entail. The difference with Okada's single, however, is that it eventually did see a release within a compilation album in 1999, 13 years after Okada's death. With that considered, I do have hope that In the Distance may someday see a release and that people can finally hear the song after over 30 years. This is actually a search I've been leading and have been super involved in for almost a year now. If anyone is interested in checking out my progress, check out the links in the description below. I mainly post my findings on Lost Media Wiki, so that would probably be the most reliable source to check out if you're really into the search and want to see the latest findings. Hitogata, or White Shadow People. Lost Japanese commercial from the late 80s to early 2000s. While very little is known about this piece of media, and existence of it is not completely confirmed, it is a situation similar to the famous Clockman search, as many people have claimed to have seen it, and the accounts of what they saw are all pretty similar. 
Itogata, meaning white humans, is supposedly a Japanese advertisement that was about 15 seconds in length and it was believed to be a PSA for railway safety that was viewable in schools or on television late at night. The commercial is said to feature the sound of a railway crossing sign ringing as two white human figures, both void of any features, appear on the screen. The figures are said to fade in and out in an alternating pattern, while one fades out, the other one fades in. Text is said to appear on the screen that reads, Every two seconds, someone dies on the earth. Or something creepy like that. Some reports state that a narrator speaks this line, as well as some varying claims that the amount of time stated was not two seconds. Either way, this commercial sounds extremely disturbing and unsettling, and I kinda wanna see it. The search officially began in 2004 when a poster on 2chan, or Nichan, posted it in a thread about Japanese ads that creep people out. Since then, Hitogata has become kind of a Japanese urban legend, and its existence has not yet been confirmed, though the search remains strong. If any of you guys are interested in helping out with this search, or if you have actually come across this ad at some point, I've provided some links below. BS Zelda Partially found video game for the Nintendo Saddle of You service. Nintendo's Saddle of You service was pretty ahead of its time. Essentially, it was a satellite connected modem created to connect to the Super Famicom system. The service was launched in 1995 and lasted up until the year 2000. Again, being super before its time, it was a video game streaming service long before PlayStation Now and GameTap. On another note, does anyone else remember GameTap? In addition to games, Saddle of View subscribers could also access magazines and other online content. The satellite connectivity was provided by the Japanese satellite radio company St. Giga, which was the first satellite digital audio broadcast corporation in the world. Whatever that means. Anyways, because the service was only accessible via satellite, games weren't available in physical form. And because the games were only available via download through the satellite service, they were only available during certain time slots, much like a TV program, and were sometimes discontinued and unplayable after certain dates. The most interesting element of the Saddle of You service itself was the special exclusive games available only on the Saddle of You service. This includes an updated and enhanced remake of The Legend of Zelda that was never released after the service was discontinued. Because of this, the game, BS Zelda no Densetsu, that's Japan language for Legend of Zelda. It's partially lost, and in case you were wondering, that BS stands for Broadcasting System, not the other kind of BS. As I said before, the games on the Saddle of You system were only available during certain time slots, very much like an actual television station and very much like TV before TiVo or DVR recording. BS Zelda no Densetsu was originally broadcasted during August of 1995 though it was on reruns in September, October, and November of 1995, as well as January of 1997. The game was released in four parts, meaning one different part each week, and this made it especially hard to obtain the entire game in any form, video, ROM, or otherwise. Despite that, as I said earlier, the game is partially found. The only known ROM dumped online comes from the third week broadcast of the game, making the majority of the game still lost. There was also supposed to be narration over the game, done by voice actors playing Princess Zelda. This is unfortunately lost as the narration elements were broadcasted and not part of the game data itself. As a huge fan of Nintendo, especially the Legend of Zelda games, I would love to see this game released in some form in the future and to be able to play it. The fact that there's a remake or enhanced version of the original Zelda out there that isn't completely available is pretty interesting to me. Hopefully it will be available sometime in the future. And this isn't the only Saddle of You exclusive game out there. There's a few others and I'll cover them in future videos. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Phantom Blood. Years before the immensely popular 2012 anime by David Productions, there was another anime adaptation of Phantom Blood, the first part of the long-running manga series JoJo's Bizarre Adventure known in Japan as Jojo no Kimio Naboken. The film, aptly titled Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Phantom Blood, 
was a completed film that was 91 minutes in length. The film was produced by Studio App and had a theme song created by Japanese hip-hop group Sold Out. The film did see a theatrical release. It was released in celebration of the 25th anniversary of Hirohiko Araki, the creator of JoJo's 25th anniversary as a manga creator. It was also released to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manga. The film was co-produced by Bandai, who holds the rights to make JoJo's Bizarre Adventure video games to this day. The film was in production for a few years at least, as it was initially teased at the Tokyo International Anime Fair in 2004. Bondi had even made a PlayStation 2 game based on the Phantom Blood manga to coincide with the release of the game. After the theatrical release, with the last showing being held on April 9th of 2007, the film was never shown again. The official reason for this has never been stated or confirmed by an official source. Despite that, there has been plenty of speculation throughout the fanbase. I mean, these are JoJo fans we're talking about. I'm one myself, so I know how they be. The reasons include poor reception, Studio App losing the license to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure after the theatrical release, and some also speculate that the creator himself despises the film. The Phantom Blood film was missing key scenes from part one and outright excluded important characters, like Speedwagon, who was both popular and essential to the plot of part one. And you seriously can't do that to my boy Speedwagon. A theatrical trailer for the film is available for download on the film's webpage, and for a while, that was the only found footage available of the film itself. It was not until 2012 when a YouTube user posted 16 minutes of the film with no voices and only music. The poster was a student at the Academy of Arts University and the uploaded video was a sound design assignment. This is because a work print of the film's first 16 minutes was provided to the university by the film's composer. These 16 minutes are the only available footage of this film that have been found, making it partially found. Though with Speedwagon missing, is it even worth watching at all? Mobile Adapter GB, Pokemon Crystal Data, Lost Japan Only Mobile Adapter DLC for Pokemon Crystal. If you're a huge Pokemon fan like myself, you may have assumed that Diamond and Pearl were the first games with internet accessibility. Well, what if I told you that the first Pokemon RPG with online functionality was Pokemon Crystal version, way back in the year 2001? And, I mean, online gaming was definitely a thing before 2001. Fantasy Star Online slapped on the Dreamcast, but as far as Game Boy Color games, that's... Pretty, pretty before it's time, at least in my opinion. Anywho, the Mobile Adapter GB was an accessory for the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. It essentially was an adapter that connected your Game Boy to your cell phone and allowed internet access that allowed multiple features to be unlocked in games, including the one few legit and official ways to catch Celebi in the second gen Pokemon games. The online service also allowed the option to battle and trade Pokemon and offered event Pokemon, special mail, and eggs to be downloaded through the service as well. Unlike today's video games, save files were more fragile and testy back in the early days of Pokemon, as save files were stored on the RAM of the cartridge and that saved state and data fully dependent on the battery that was within the cartridge itself. And as somebody who has witnessed the corruption of my save file due to that battery running out on my Pokemon Silver cartridge, the one that had all my childhood Pokemon, it... it's not fun. <laughs> But yeah, this essentially means that when the battery goes out, the save data becomes corrupted and lost. And I mean, you can, however, change the battery, and this allows the games to be saved again, but you can't do it between save states. At least in my experience, you can't. So it kind of sucks. My rambling about Game Boy cartridge batteries does have a point, though, I assure you. See, because of the fragile save states of these games, that meant that files with the data downloaded from the mobile adapter GB are lost to time. And of course, there is the very, very small chance that there is a cartridge of Pokemon Crystal out there that still has a working battery with a save file of this very obscure phone DLC that costed a lot of money to download and buy and maintain. I mean, there is a chance, but it is a very slim chance. It's also worth taking into consideration that the mobile adapter GB was not popular and did not sell very well in Japan. It was discontinued only a little bit after a year of its initial release. This is a situation kind of similar to the Saddle of You thing, where this data was downloaded through online content, you had to access it online, 
And it is possible that Nintendo could still have the rights and the files for this data and this lost content. So, I mean, there's hope of actually finding it that way. And, I mean, it's not completely lost. There's still some data from menus and unfinished English translations that have been uncovered and made available online. So, I mean, there's that. Pink Crows, Lost Music Video Animations from 1985. Long before the presence of the band Gorillaz, in 1985 there existed a short-lived cartoon band titled Pink Crows. As the name suggests, it's a band consisting of four pink animated crows. The crows were officially described by media outlets as a pop group of aliens. Hence the pink color, probably. The band was created as a side project of an artist known as Nobody. There were three singles released in total, all in 1985 and available to listen to on YouTube if you'd like to give them a listen yourself. They're not bad. The third and final single, titled Suddenly Want You, was used as a theme song to an anime called Showa Ahozoshi Akanuke Ichiban, an anime that ran from 1985 to 1986 that I actually really want to check out upon looking it up. The music video itself was the first of two, the second being for the song Kanojo wa Pinkish. And I say music video rather than music videos because it was the original understanding by fans that the video for the second single was the only music video created for Pink Crows. But the existence for the first single's music video was confirmed later in the translation of an article in Anime V magazine. And while not entirely confirmed, it has been speculated that the first lost music video is for the song Here Comes Pink Crows as that will be the band's first single in their discography. It is also believed that the music video was released by the end of April of 1985 and that the music video for the second single was released by the end of June 1985. This is again according to magazine articles. According to the Japanese Wikipedia article for Pink Crows, the music videos were worked on to some extent by the animation company Sunrise. Sunrise is known for working on anime like Cowboy Bebop, Code Geass, City Hunter, and even the new Inuyasha sequel series airing this year, Yashahime. Even an article published in My Anime Magazine features multiple images from a promotional video for the band. Later on, through the tweets of a Twitter user known as Starzans, it has been discovered that the Pink Crows band was managed by somebody named Terumi Yoshida and that the music videos were directed by Takeji Yamana. Other information found within these tweets are that the videos are 100% animated and that the Pink Crows have a rockabilly style. Aside from the tweets, the most information available regarding the lost videos are found in multiple magazine articles that covered Pink Crows in 1985. This includes My Anime Magazine, which featured a two-page spread discussing the music video in the April 1985 issue. The title card for the music video was also discovered through this article as well, as well as multiple stills from the music videos themselves. As of the recording of this video, both music videos do remain completely lost and unable to view online in any capacity. This could possibly change if a television station or the producers or somebody with the rights to the video releases it at some point. There is a decent chance of these music videos being seen again since they seem pretty well documented and there was a lot of press surrounding them at the time. The Nickelodeon Japan Shutdown Partially Lost TV Station While Nickelodeon was a staple for children's television in the West, in Japan, that isn't really the case. Or at least for the television station itself, it isn't. Some iconic Nick shows, like Spongebob Squarepants, still air in Japan today and are really popular. Though Spongebob doesn't air on Nickelodeon. In Japan, it's currently on TV Tokyo, though it's been on other channels like MTV Japan. It's also strangely entertaining to watch Spongebob in Japanese. Don't really know why. So yeah, long story short, popular Nick shows exist on different channels in Japan. The TV station itself, however, had a more brief and obscure history. Well, if you consider a little over a decade brief, I mean, I personally do, because that's not really that long in comparison to United States Nick. Nickelodeon Japan launched on November 15th of 1998 and was exclusive to DirecTV originally. It later went over to Sky Perfect TV in 2000. There's a good amount of information available for the lineup of shows available. They were basically Nick shows with different titles and a Japanese dub. As well as that, there were blocks of programming provided and complete schedules that can be easily found. And while a lot of the dubs remain lost, which again, that's going to be a topic for another video because there is a lot of lost dubs, the shutdown of the channel itself remains pretty mysterious. 
footage of the sudden shutdown remained lost for quite some time, and it's not really confirmed if it's been found or not yet. We'll get to that in a little bit. On September 30th of 2009, Nick Japan abruptly went off the air due to gradual drops in viewership. There are two known videos claiming to be footage of the shutdown, though in my opinion they look a little janky and fake. Though, while I was editing and creating this video for y'all, I did notice that a third video has surfaced, and this one actually looks legit, so if it is, that's pretty exciting news. Going back to the original two videos posted, the first one was uploaded to Nico Nico and featured a Spongebob bumper that cut out abruptly. The other one shows the Nickelodeon Japan logo and cuts the bars and then later static. As I said, neither video has been confirmed to be real, and there's not much validity and there's not really any way of really proving them true. Both of them may be fake, both of them may be real, all three of them might be real, depending on what provider. It's really mysterious and hard to really find any credible evidence to any of it, which is makes it even more interesting in my opinion. But yeah, like I said, in a recent comment on the Lost Media Wiki page for the Nick Japan shutdown, there's actually someone with a link to the third recording that I mentioned. This one looks the most legitimate, like I said, and it was uploaded on March 23rd of 2020. This video shows end credits and a Nick Japan bumper before cutting to a screen, likely from the service provider, like a Dish Network kind of thing, saying there's no service or there's no channel available. The actual Japanese on this screen says Kono channel wa arimasen, by the way. But yeah, there is no real way of confirming the credibility or realness of any of this, so perhaps we'll just never know. Early advertisements for McDonald's Japan. Lost early commercials. Japanese McDonald's is definitely unlike the traditional American McDonald's experience. I know from my own personal visits to Japanese McDonald's establishments that the exclusive food at Japanese McDonald's slaps. Like really, they had a rice burger back in February. It was, it was godlike. Also the ice cream floats and the cherry blossom burgers. I mean, everything there is so good. Anyways, moving on. So while McDonald's is very well known in today's Japan, their beginnings in the country are pretty mysterious and not well documented. This especially goes for their earliest advertisements on television. The very first McDonald's opened in Japan on July 20th of 1971 at the Mitsukoshi department store in Ginza, Tokyo. And while there is no longer a McDonald's there, Mitsukoshi Ginza is still definitely there. Plus, there's a McDonald's right next to it. Shortly after, in 1973, McDonald's began airing their first television advertisements. And the entirety of these early ads, airing between 1973 and 1976, are completely lost. The earliest ad available aired in 1977, and ads from then onward are fairly easy to find and view online. The interesting part about this is there are those who have claimed to have seen these ads and describe them as pretty bizarre and comedic. People also state that these ads didn't really look like they were advertising a restaurant at all, which isn't really unusual for Japanese ads. There is hope of seeing these early ads someday, as it is likely that McDonald's Japan does have the rights and has them stored somewhere. There's also the fact that McDonald's does have the exact date of the airing of the first episode available. One of these ads is said to include Ronald McDonald rowing a wooden boat on a river and lands it without noticing at all. And I mean, if that doesn't make you crave a quarter pounder with cheese, I don't know what will. Final Fantasy VI, the interactive CG game, also known as Final Fantasy 64, a lost playable tech demo. So I love Final Fantasy. Seven is easily one of my favorite games of all time. And so is six. And eight. Regardless of what people say or think about eight. So, of course, when I found out that there was a tech demo featuring full 3D renderings of characters from Final Fantasy VI that was made for the Nintendo 64 in 1995, I was pretty hype. And a little sad since VI is an amazing game and definitely needs a remake, just as much as VII did. The really interesting thing about this piece of lost media is what it suggests and the history behind it. Specifically because this demo is for the Nintendo 64. See, Squaresoft, as Square Enix was formerly known, 
was making Final Fantasy games exclusively for Nintendo consoles up until that point. But, when 7 was in development, the developers felt that 64 wasn't technologically advanced enough to handle the lengthy narrative they wanted to tell with 7, particularly with how Nintendo chose to have 64 games on cartridges. And of course, there was a Nintendo 64 DD, but that's a subject for another day and another video on Japanese lost media, because that's pretty extensive. Look forward to it. Long story short, this led to 7 being released on the PlayStation in 1997. The Lost Demo itself was unveiled in August of 1995 at SIGGRAPH 95, a convention that also had the premiere of the Jimmy Neutron pilot, which is a pretty cool coincidence. And as mentioned previously, it featured characters from Final Fantasy VI, characters being Terra, Locke, and Shadow, as they were involved in a turn-based battle that had a lot of elements that were eventually moved over to Final Fantasy VII. The quality of these models and the animation for the tech demo is pretty impressive for the time, and could easily pass for a finished game, in my opinion. While the demo itself is lost, there is footage of the gameplay that has survived, as the footage was made available for the public on a PlayStation promotional disc. This disc contained a playable demo of Final Fantasy VII, a playable demo of Final Fantasy 64 itself, though, it's still lost. Totsukeki Human Lost Live Action TV Series from 1972 Totsukeki Human Translated to Assault Human I I'm doing that because there's exclamation points between the words. Is a Japanese tokusatsu series that aired from October to December of 1972. Tokusatsu is a genre of Japanese television and film, and it's basically live action with a large amount of costumes, props, and special effects. The word tokusatsu itself translates to special filming. There are a few popular examples of tokusatsu. These include Gojira or Godzilla, and Super Sentai, which was localized for a Western audience to be Power Rangers. What is known about Assault Human is that the show ran for only 13 episodes and has a plot similar to Kamen Rider or Super Sentai. It involved a former gymnastics coach that transformed into a superhero to protect children targeted by monsters that suddenly appeared. Unfortunately, the entire show is lost in its original form and has never been released after its television run. Toho, the production company, has been reported to have accidentally recorded over the tapes of Assault Human with another program, something that, like I said, was pretty commonplace in the early days of Japanese television. And a home recording of the show is extremely unlikely since this was the early 70s. Monsters of Assault Human do still exist in another form, as the suits were used in another show, Ike Green Man, which is another tokusatsu show that ran from November of 1973 to September of 1974, and has 54 full episodes. I believe some of the monster footage from Assault Human is also used in this series, but I couldn't really find a definitive answer or report regarding that, but I do know for sure that the suits were used in this show. There was also a series of live performances that took place following the finale of Assault Human. These typically took place in small venues like shopping malls. An amateur recording of one of these performances does exist. Big X, partially found Osamu Tezuka anime. Osamu Tezuka, known as the father of manga and even the god of manga, created manga and anime as we know it today, with his most famous creation Astro Boy, or Mighty Adam as it is originally titled in Japan. While Astro Boy is the best known and most influential, Tezuka-sensei gave life to a plethora of manga and anime up until his death in 1989. Also, going on a little tangent here, I highly recommend checking out the anime adaptation of Dororo, the recent one, as it's pretty dope and pretty, pretty wild. Anywho, long story short, Osama Tezuka has created a lot of great stuff, and much of it received anime adaptations. Among those, airing in 1964 and 1965, was Big X, the adaptation of a manga that had began serialization only a year earlier in 1963 and was still running. The anime of Big X itself is notable in that it was the very first anime series produced by Tokyo Movie, or TMS, which is best known for the anime adaptations of The Rose of Versailles, Akira, and Sonic X. The plot of Big X itself is about a boy who can increase his body size to that of a giant, and this is from the result of a failed Nazi experiment. 
really wild thing is that this plot is roughly based on an actual experiment that actually took place during World War II. Because Big X never received a home release of any kind, the majority of the series is lost, as only 21 of the 59 episodes are known to still exist. Jerry Beck, a collector who had the first episode available in a 16mm print, had attempted to show the film at one point, but was forbidden from doing so by a TMS executive. Beck did, however, end up loaning the film to the studio to be copied and archived. According to TMS, the anime series itself is lost. As of the recording of this video, episodes 1 and 11 are viewable on YouTube. They are also subtitled in English, so that's pretty cool. It's my hope that someday the recordings will be recovered, though film back then was often recorded over, and thus a lot of things are pretty much lost the time and unrecoverable. I still have a little hope though. The many lost music videos of Mina no Uta, partially found NHK show. Mina no Uta, meaning everyone's songs in English, is a long-running Japanese program that features one or two music videos over a span of 15 minutes in each episode. The show first debuted on NHK in 1961 and is still airing today. It showcases new music and new episodes are released every two months. Because of its long run and lack of any home release, many of the unique music videos remain lost, specifically the early broadcasts between 1961 and 1982. It has been estimated, according to Lost Media Archive, that about 500 of the 1300 music videos that aired during this time are completely lost. The majority of these missing music videos are likely completely lost, like completely gone and unfindable at all, as the two-inch videotapes with the early Mino no Uta episodes were reused to record other NHK programs. Back in the day, tapes were very expensive and it made more sense financially to just reuse the tapes for other programs. Though, in honor of the show's 50th anniversary, in 2011, an excavation project conducted by NHK was initiated in an attempt to recover as many of the lost music videos as possible. And the good news here is that at least 90 of the music videos have been successfully recovered since the start of the project. Not only that, but 200 pieces of audio have been recovered as well since the start of the project. Some of these recovered pieces of media had the opportunity to be re-aired in 2012 in a television special about the show. With the project still going, hopefully more music videos, and pieces of audio at least, will be found. As a fan of Showa era music, I really do have my fingers crossed on this one. Doraemon, 1973 partially found anime series. Now, this is something that's been talked about a lot by a few other people on the YouTubes, so I wanted to save it for a little later in the video so I can get some more juicy obscureness in first. So, Doraemon is pretty much known by everyone in Japan. It's kind of like the Peanuts or Scooby-Doo is to Western audiences. It's one of those things where, while you may not be a fan, you've definitely at least seen the characters before. The series itself, revolving around a robotic cat with no ears, began as a comedy manga by the mangaka duo Fujiko F. Fujio in 1969, and the original manga ran up until 1996. The best-known anime adaptation of Doraemon is the second series that ran from 1979 to 2005, and is the one most people grew up with and know fairly well. Doraemon is still a common staple in Japanese television, as the current iteration began airing in 2005, after the end of the 1979 series. However, before the 1979 series, there was another series that very few actually know about. This is the Lost 1973 series. Well, partially lost. This was a short-lived adaptation that ran for only 26 episodes from April to September of 1973. This adaptation was produced by NTV Video and was less comedic in tone than the 79 series. Due to numerous issues within the production company, ranging from budget, the resignation of the original president, and the eventual bankruptcy of the studio, Doraemon's 1973 adaptation was not extended for another season. NTV was unfortunately dissolved due to the bankruptcy, and that's where things get a little complicated. When the production company went under, the film reels of the anime were all sold off and ultimately separated. It's even possible that some of these film reels were thrown away or completely destroyed as well. At least, that is what has been reported to have happened to properties of the company that were unable to be sold off. Back then, people didn't really see the value of film reels or animation cells for that matter. 
1973 anime was rebroadcasted briefly in 1979, but was pulled quickly due to the new anime's release. This was so that the viewers would not confuse the older series for the newer one, or vice versa. After this, the first anime adaptation of Doraemon was never seen again. That is until 1995. This was when three episodes of the 1973 series were discovered by Studio Rush, known today as Imagica. The episodes found were 18, 20, and 26. The production chief of the original Doraemon anime, Masumi Jun, was fortunately able to uncover other segments within his own search in 2003, though some did not have the original audio. In 1998, a videotape recording of episode 18b was also discovered. Later on, in 2004, a Japanese student created a blog dedicated to finding rare advertisements and scarce information. By the end of that year, an anonymous person had sent the blog owner a recording tape that had included the opening and end credits for the 1973 Doraemon anime. Decent quality footage of the opening and ending exists as well, and I was able to easily find them on YouTube. As for the remaining episodes, some other segments have been found out of the 26 since 2004, and still images and animation cells have been uncovered as well. The list of media available and uncovered for each episode can be found on the Lost Media Wiki page. Monster School Lost Japanese Puppet Television Show from 2003 This is another pretty popular search, and for good reason. Despite airing from 2001 to 2006 for a total of five whole years, there is absolutely no footage available for the show, or its 54 episodes. Just let that sink in. An entire TV show airing at a time where it could have been easily recorded by someone at home, a show with 54 episodes in total, is not available anywhere online. Like, what? That being said, very little is known about Monster School, aside from the basic premise and how the show looked. Basically, it was a children's show that aired on NHK and was live action, but the characters were portrayed by puppets. The series was aimed at children and served the purpose of teaching its viewers important communication skills. Probably manners, etiquette, stuff like that. It featured a colorful cast of, of course, monsters. A good number of these monsters were based on Japanese folklore. Other than that, we do know that the show revolved around a second grade boy who attended school with a wide variety of monsters within his apartment complex. It is also believed, though not completely confirmed, that the main boy, Nobrio, had a sister named Kotenga. This is only based on speculation from episode titles, since that's all they really have to work on. Aside from this info, the only actual media found include two low-resolution screenshots and the brief upload of a YouTube video by a user titled Dadistalon? Forgive me if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but the video did contain the full second episode. And this isn't something you can really go look up and watch now, as the episode uploaded was unfortunately taken down by NHK and is no longer available. With that said, I'm fairly confident that NHK has this series documented somewhere in a warehouse or at their studio or whatnot. I don't really think that this is something lost to time like a lot of the older pieces of media. I think that this may be a copyright issue with the creator or something like that, just a legal reason why people aren't able to actually watch the show. Though, hopefully, in the near future, we'll be able to watch Monster School and see what it's all about. Oso Matsukun found original 1966 anime series. Now, if you're an anime fan, you've probably heard of Osomatsu-san. It's a comedy anime that serves as a sequel to Osomatsu-kun. Osomatsu-san is pretty crude but very funny and even heartfelt at times. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it already. But today, my friends, in this video, we are not here to talk about Osomatsu-san. We are here to look at Osomatsu-kun, the original 1966 black and white anime that's vastly different in tone and comedic style than the 2015 modernized sequel. Osomatsu-kun basically follows the comedic shenanigans and daily life of identical sextuplets and is based on the manga by Fujio Akatsuka, a name as famous as Osamu Tezuka in Japan. 
There was also a remake in 1988. As I briefly touched upon a little earlier in the video, older media was not stored or preserved very well at all. For years, it was believed that the entirety of the 1966 series was lost completely at some point during the 1970s. The Search had an unexpected happy ending as the series was rediscovered printed on a 16mm print within a TV station warehouse in 1990. This fortunate discovery allowed the re-airing of Osamatsu-kun on television and the release of the series on both VHS and later DVD. This allows for hope that someday other lost series may be found in some warehouse somewhere. Who knows? The Japanese Pokemon anime pilot found original 1997 airing. While the original Japanese first episode of Pokemon is readily available, there was an original edit of the episode only seen during its initial premiere in 1997 that was lost for quite some time. The reasoning behind this lied in the initial airing of the December 16, 1997 episode Denno Senchi Porygon, best known in English as Electric Soldier Porygon. Yes, I'm talking about the seizure episode. This episode, being the 38th episode of Season 1, saw a lot of serious issues upon its airing and is infamous within the Pokemon and even the Nintendo fandoms. This episode, being the one and only time Porygon has ever been seen in the Pokemon anime, only aired one time in the anime's 20 plus year run and is best known for the Pokemon Shock incident. The incident itself resulted in 685 viewers being taken to the hospital, with two having to be remain hospitalized for at least two weeks. The episode itself contained a scene with rapid flashing lights triggering photosensitive epileptic seizures in the hospitalized viewers. Definitely some scary stuff. The event itself triggered the aftermath of a four-month hiatus for the Pokemon anime until it returned in April of 1998. Upon returning, scenes of the anime were heavily edited in order to prevent future incidents. Among these altered episodes was the very first episode of the anime that existed in an edited form from that point on. With the original pilot only airing one time before the Porygon incident, it was lost and unavailable to view for a very long time. Though years later, episodes of the original Pokemon anime available in the format presented during the original airing were made available on Hulu Japan, though the original cut of the first episode remained lost. It was not until May 2nd of 2015 when Pokemon Peru, a fan group, was able to upload the original 1997 version of Episode 1, making it available after 18 whole years. And just to be safe, I am not 100% certain that the first unedited episode of Pokemon contains any kind of lighting that will affect a seizure or trigger any kind of epileptic um, occurrence. So if you do check that out on your own, uh, please be careful, I don't want anyone to get hurt, and just want to be safe, you know? Anyways, moving on. And now, we come to the little bonus I've added to this video. This one I don't really consider Japanese lost media. It was initially on my list because it has to do with Akira, one of my favorite manga and anime. Though, upon further inspection, I did notice that the developers of the game are American and European. So it doesn't really count as Japanese lost media, but the story behind this is pretty rad. So I'm gonna go ahead and include it anyway, so enjoy! Akira, cancelled 1994 video game. To anime fans, Akira is incredibly well known and even considered essential to watch among many. Some can even agree that Akira may be responsible to an extent for sparking the popularity of anime in the West or at least getting the ball rolling. While the manga and anime, both the creation of Katsuhiro Otomo, are pretty well known, few are aware that there were actually multiple video games based on the Akira anime in development. Consoles the game was in development for include the Sega Genesis, Sega CD, Super Nintendo, and even portable consoles such as the Game Boy and Game Gear. The games were in development by a man named Jim Gregory, and the games have been transferred between developers over the course of development. According to Gregory himself, the game was ultimately cancelled due to unmeetable demands of THQ, one of the developers that obtained the rights, and the lead programmer quitting prior to the completion of the game. While a physical copy of the SNES title does not exist, 
Again, according to Gregory, the other master copies are believed to be in the possession of whoever owns the license to Akira currently in Western territories. There does exist a Commodore Amiga CD32 game based on Akira, released in 1994, though this is a completely separate game entirely, made by a different developer in Europe. The game was poorly received, and I can confirm that it does suck. Like, really sucks. It was not until 2013 that footage of the Genesis port of the game became available for the very first time. Said footage was taken from a recording of the 1994 Consumer Electronics Show and was uploaded by YouTube user PookNinja3. And kind of mini tangent here, but doesn't it feel really weird when you have to pronounce somebody's online username out loud? Like when you say it, it just feels unnatural, but you know you're saying it correctly, hopefully. Does that make sense? In 2016, user PS Nation uploaded yet another clip from the Consumer Electronics Show in 1994. This clip being a different one entirely from the 2013 footage and showed more gameplay as well as the game's intro. A little later, in August of 2016, four prototypes of the Game Boy version were found by Twitter user Origina PSP? Origina PSP. I can't read my own handwriting, I'm so sorry if I butchered your name. Later on, in December of that same year, he uploaded footage of the fourth prototype build, which included the first and final stage. This build included a pretty dope 8-bit rendition of the game's soundtrack, hidden within the build. And on Christmas Day of 2019, Lost Media Wiki user Hidden Palace had announced an exciting find. A cartridge of the Sega Genesis version of the game had been found. This cartridge, provided by another LMW user named Matsuda, as well as an anonymous donor, was later dumped online. 65% of the game's data is accessible in gameplay, and with this, we can conclude that the Genesis version of Akira is officially found. The game's visuals are pretty awesome and pretty detailed. I highly recommend checking out available videos online. It's clear that the people who made this game really took to heart the incredible visual style of Akira, um, specifically the beautiful animated film. And it's a real shame that this was never finished and brought to light so a lot of people could play it and enjoy it back in 1994. But yeah, guys, if you made it this far, you are at the end of my video. And thank you so much for watching. It really means a great deal for me. This is actually my return to YouTube after quite some time. I've been putting together a lot of videos, but just haven't had the time to actually bring them forth into the universe and my lovely channel. So thank you so, so much for checking this out. If you want to see more Lost Media videos, I definitely want to do that in the future. I do want to stick to my original um, type of content I was going for with my channel, Sakura Stardust, which is video game and anime related stuff too. So definitely look forward to more of that. Um, that's not going anywhere. That's gonna still going to be my main thing. Um, but this other stuff on the side as well. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, guys. You're great. I love you all. And have the loveliest of lovely days. Bye! Guys, look how cute my dog is. Just, just take him in for a minute. He's beautiful.